All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Friends Occasionally Not Disagreeing, uh, the one where we try to tackle the Wheel of Time again, because <laughs> as, as it proved to be uh, too much material to fit into the episodes of the TV season appropriately, it also was too much for us to fit into one podcast appropriately. So <laughs> we split it up into two. We're back for part two. So not the beginning, but it is a beginning. Yes, well played. Oh. Very nice. <laughs> so where we left off last time was we had wrapped up our discussion of episode four, which pushed us smack dab in the middle of the season. And so I guess we'll just jump into it. I don't think we need to... Do you feel you want to rehash anything that we talked about before or just jump into the next episode? Uh, I don't think so. I think we kind of got to... Nope, that's not true. We're not there yet. Never mind. <laughs> Well, dear listeners, uh, if you need a refresher, feel free to check out uh, episode nine, was it? Yeah, episode nine. Yeah. Wonderful. And that'll bring you right up to speed. Fair enough. All right. Well, so let's get into episode five here. An episode titled uh, Blood Calls Blood, um, which the note I made here was it, it felt like it was the most emotional episode of the season. I think it really brought the feels. Um, so. Yeah. We started off with a, a burial for the soldiers and and the one Aes Sedai who died in the battle in which Loghain's army came to try to free him. Um, and they, they ended up fighting off the army, you know, dispersing them, whatever. Uh, but they did lose uh, Karene, the Aes Sedai, and, um, you know, uh, several of the, the soldiers with them. So um, we started off with that. Um, we see uh, like Rand and Matt, you know, finally reaching Tar- Tarvalon, um, which um, <laughs> just another kind of thing in the show where things are just kind of accelerated. Um, they they make a mention of it took like months to get there, but it was only like two episodes <laughs> in our time. <laughs> yeah, it just um, comes to it one month later, and then they're <laughs> arriving. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, we also get scenes with. Um, you know, uh, the, the white cloaks, um, they, they find the tinkers, they're questioning tinkers and, and Valda sees Perrin and Egwene in there. And he's like, I remember you. And so he beats up some tinkers and takes them captive. Um, and then one of my favorite parts of the, of the season, because he's one of my favorite characters, we get loyal. Loyal is an awesome character in the series. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, he's really well done. I feel, um, except for perhaps his hair. I, I I wasn't sure about his hair choice, but (laughs) everything else about loyal is great. Um, and we get a scene with, with Rand Matt, they're watching, uh, Loghain being paraded through the city. Um, and Loghain has a moment where he just acts completely nutsy cuckoo and just, sees something and it makes him laugh like a madman um which is is something that um I, you could probably piece it together later on if you if you thought about it but in the moment it uh it, it really is not it, it just kind of comes across as well he's just crazy and, and, that, and that's it but um it, it actually does have a significance to it that uh fans of the books would, would understand pretty clearly. Okay. Um, uh, then we, we get more with, with Valda. He's interrogating Egwene. He um, just flays parents back because he's a, a right bastard. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we, like later on parent admits to, to being the one who actually killed his wife. Um, and we, we really see the development of, of where this whole thing with the wolves goes, which is a, a really cool scene. I actually, I, I feel like the way they did it in the show is actually better than the books. It's, it's one of the few things, you know, where I was like, yeah, they did this really, this was a good choice. That was, that's what, you know, that worked out really well. Um, and, you know, this whole time we're getting this, this, this bit at the white tower where where Stepan has lost his warder and he's he's essentially you know at, on suicide watch he's he's 
in massive grieving. Um, and, you know, they have the ceremony um, to, to melt down the ring and there's you know, everything else with that. And in the end, he ends up killing himself. And then, um, you know, they have a ceremony where, where Lan and the other warriors grieve for the loss of Stepin, which was a really powerful scene. So, um, I guess I'll kick it off you guys too. Has some, uh, some thoughts on this one? Was the um, Stepin plot, is that in the books? I didn't remember no, it if it was. Um, oh, I, I don't believe he's in the books at all. I, I think he's a new character. Both, okay. Both, um, Corinne, the name I sounds familiar. On it that sounds one. familiar, yeah, but I don't know that she, she definitely doesn't have a like a, a role that's like a big role in the books. If, if she is a character, okay, of the 2700 characters, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> holy crap. Uh, uh, yeah, this is another one that I did not get a chance to watch again, but you are right on the money with the emotional because I remember some of these scenes very well with the white cloaks and Egwene and Perrin. Um, and Valda, like just that initial scene where we see him like eating food in the earlier episodes, and then here he's just like, This guy's a badass, and like in an evil way, like he comes across, you know, it's just vile with his beliefs, which is kind of how the white cloaks are somewhat presented in the books, not all of them, and they're diverse just like any other group in the book, but um, sure, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, if I can st- step in for a second with regards to Child Valda and Did you and say the White step Clubs. in? No, come on. Uh, oh, not by intent. <laughs> too uh, soon. Too soon. So, um, in the, I'm going to kind of draw attention here to another classical fantasy, you know, uh, uh, construct, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. There is a for like every character uh, and creature in in the game, there's an alignment grid where basically it goes from good to evil and lawful to chaotic. And uh, I think uh, Child Valda is a perfect example of why the, the, sometimes the scariest alignment isn't like chaotic evil or neutral evil. Sometimes the scariest alignment is lawful neutral. Which, that's a that's a person who has their code of conduct. They adhere to it without question regardless of who it hurts or what the consequences are and he is an absolutely perfect example of that taken to the extreme and it was really interesting seeing a potential villain character who wasn't just you know flat out evil but he had reasons for what he's doing he thinks what he's doing is right it some people might consider what he's doing to be right but the way he's doing it is just monstrous. And I thought that made him a very effective antagonist in, in, in this show and in this episode in particular. Man, scary. Yeah, so, those are great thoughts. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, totally Thanks. agree. Totally agree uh, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, conversely, uh, completely different... Um, type of, of characters, the, the Tinkers ended up being a lot more uh, trustworthy than I expected because for a while there was this little thought in the back of my head saying that, eh, they seem a little too nice. They seem a little too, you know, pure and, you know, uh, welcoming and forthcoming. There's got to be something going on. And then they turn out to actually be embodying those things. It's like, <laughs> yeah. holy crap. So I really do like how the show does play with, um, with my my expectations at least i'm not sure about those of you who are familiar with the source material but i i enjoyed that it's like okay sometimes you know if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck it actually is a duck and not something that's going to try and stab you in the back and sell you to the dark one uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah the, the tinkers I, I were really well done they they're exactly what i envisioned from the yeah, books i agree yeah, right down to even the the visual, the look of them is is, is spot on. Cool. Yep. Um, though I will say, uh, in the last the last episode where we talked about this, I did mention a couple of times where it felt like certain things were touched upon and then never mentioned again, like terminology or places or people or what have you. And this episode, I have the most notes about that sort of thing. Um, things that they look like they're going to be important at some point, they might be, but they're mentioned very pointedly in certain scenes and then never brought up again. 
<laughs> um, there's a, a part where Rand is in a, a, a library with Loyal, uh, or before Loyal shows up, and he's looking through a book, and it's in a language we can't read. Uh, it's got a, a picture that we can't really make out because it's upside down and kind of facing away from the camera. And he's, he says something like, oh, the Carathian cycle. And then that's all he says about it. He doesn't say like wh why he <laughs> mentioned it, why it needed to be brought up. And then Loyal comes in and he shuts the book and we never hear about it again. Not mm -hmm. important. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only the basis of the whole, the whole story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we don't know that if you're just, if we're just watching the show. Um, there is also uh, like later on, there's, I'm trying to remember the context because I had, I've written down Forsaken and I remember these things were like little figurines and mm -hmm. I think it was maybe Rand was one of the people involved, but uh, they, they're they on this sort of like pedestal and one character says to another, oh, people still believe in those and they talk a little bit about them, how they're like uh, icons of people who sold their souls for immortality, but they were sealed by the last dragon. And uh, it's like, okay, that's kind of interesting and weird, but never brought up again, at least in this season. Yeah. And it's, I had a lot of questions about what relevance these these things are going to happen later on uh, have later on and you addressed a bit of that and i i'm, I'm sure the uh carethian cycle is is going to factor more in but it was a name i don't believe had that had ever been mentioned before in the series and i don't think it's ever mentioned since same with mm. the forsaken same with you know a couple other things but um it does kind of illustrate the difficulty of trying to walk the tightrope of giving enough information but not leaving things out and I think this episode really kind of faltered in that sense because I left with more more questions than I had answers on a lot of things yeah really the the lack of of having the, any information really at all about the Forsaken in, in the first season is one of my bigger complaints of it um, because they absolutely are like one of the biggest parts of the of the book series um, and it's right from the start and oh, cool. um yeah to to only get this essentially that's i think it's the only really the only mention of them even through the whole first season is this one scene where Stepan is is praying and you know doing his little meditation thing mm -hmm. and um yeah i don't remember it, maybe it was it was land maybe comes up and, and talks about i think so yeah somebody and and yeah, they, they make a mention of it. he's still he, he's trying to ward off one of the Forsaken essentially with this okay. prayer ceremony. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, that's something we can uh, we can hash out later. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would I would agree though. Like the without spoilery plot territory, but the Forsaken are probably you know <laughs> over the course of the book series probably as important if not more of the more of the plot is dedicated to them i would say in some ways than the central plot itself probably huh. yeah okay then yeah. i would not have guessed that from what we're showing in this in this, this season so. i can't remember you probably know better than i brett like how that's revealed in the book with the mythology but like i definitely get a sense in the tv show of the typical fantasy trope of like like you start with the Trolloc and the Trolloc is bad. And then you see like the fade and you're like, Ooh, this is worse. And then you're like, there's this not like, but they have to do that because you can't just in like episode one, be like, here's the worst thing in the world. And then everything else is like boring. Right. Like same as a video game or anything exactly. else. You have like to build that tension. Right. You got to start with the little things and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So, mm -hmm. okay. um, and then you were mentioning the, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. The Corinthian cycle. How did you say it? Is that, is that, uh, is that close? I, I, yeah. It was something like Kyrathian. In the audio books, it's Kyrathon cycle. Kyrathon. Ah. So, uh, Justin, in the books, they will very frequently use passages from these ancient texts here and there as yeah, like prophecies, uh, prologue, or like they'll throw in a line here or there to like intro a chapter or something. Oh. So, like, even in a four million so many word series, like they still are like, here's this little blurb that would fill out like a whole nother chapter or two. But we'll give it yeah. to you in like a page or two. So, okay. Um, huh. But that would help with some of the stuff you're talking about as yep. well, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's essentially, it's the prophecies of the dragon and how he's going to come back, what he's going to do. 
and how it's going to affect everyone else. Yeah. Okay. That's what that is. So it's, it, you know, without jumping ahead too far, the fact that Rand is holding that book is pretty ironic. <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, I like the, the bit of loyal we get here in the first season. I think my biggest complaint with him probably was a sizing issue. Yeah. So in the, it, books, the same with the, with the trucks as well, but I, it's understandable that you, you can't have like 10 foot tall characters running around. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, it creates logistical silly. problems, mm-hmm. but like, you know, they, and I thought like, so the main characters, parents supposed to be the biggest, they did a good, nice job casting that role yep. the trollocs are substantially bigger than him which they are in the show mm-hmm. and then if i'm correct isn't loyal supposed to be like almost double a trolloc like he's very large um, very large or like, like bigger uh, than for sure similar height but larger in bulkier build, bulkier okay. Yeah. okay and so i don't know but as you know there's like a shot of him i think somewhere in here when i was looking through something that was like i think it's an episode eight so i'm jumping ahead but it's like loyal's like standing next to perrin and it's like <laughs> they're you know, so yeah. right you know <laughs> i noticed that too and i was like eh, i wish he was a little bigger but you know if they could have stole the giant from game of thrones that would have been okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's often described in the books as um trollocs are the are like um the height of a man plus a half so like it would be like nine feet to ten feet tall. Okay. Which it, if you think about it, even that alone would make them like, you know, it, it makes horrifying. Them horrifying, yes. Yeah. But like to the point of being, how are humans supposed to fight against these things that are <laughs> like almost twice as tall as them? But yeah, yeah. So I I don't mind that they're larger, but not like that large as. Yeah, that's described. that's a good point. Okay. That would be hard to. Yeah, that's true. In the book, everybody yeah. must be like jumping and hitting them or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to take out his knee because that's all I can reach. <laughs> Just punch him in the nuts. Oh. <laughs> has got nuts. Give him the old dick <laughs> twist. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Loyal, as I said, is, is definitely one of my favorite characters in the books. He's, he's just such a, a great personality. He's fun. And and the the portrayal in the in the show is is spot on as far as I'm concerned. It is very, very well done. <laughs> um, he's always like, um, like he's it. it Ogier live like for like three, four hundred years. So okay. they do everything slowly because they have time to do it. <laughs> and so he, you know, when he's always like commenting on, oh, these humans are so hasty. <laughs> you know, that's that's what that's all about. Because they just they take their time to do things. Conversations take like three times as long <laughs> and, um, and he's very matter of fact about everything when he does speak yeah, yeah he's he kind of like literal about things yeah. and uh yeah it, it there's definitely some very humorous things that come about you know through this in the show um yeah. you know because of, of what's <laughs> interacting with the other characters <laughs> it just make me think of you had mentioned um jordan was really influenced by lord of the rings and like the end characters are very slow deciding with everything and moving and live very long yeah, time too. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have put that together. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything else on this one. Anybody else? Um, um, we didn't. I mean, I, I kind of brushed over. So you know, we we finally see. You know, we've, we've been hinting at at the wolves and pair, and oh. they have some sort of connection. Mm-hmm. And and really seeing, you know. It, really seeing a deeper connection here that it, it, he's actually able to like communicate with them um, was, as I said, was really done really well. I, in, in the books, it's, it's kind of like, they just kind of like dump it on him. It's not like a gradual thing. It's just like um, he, they're at this campfire and he's, he's talking with another character, which we actually get this character in season two coming up. He's actually, he's been cast and everything. So we're going to see this guy, but um, th- this guy, like, oh in, yeah and, and the wolves come in and it's just like oh by the way you can talk to these wolves and, and parents like oh <laughs> uh, and so the way they did in the show i think was was a lot better that he kind of like it's it's there but it like gets forced out of him through this terrible torture mm-hmm. um 
yeah, I, I, I like that a lot better. And so it, it definitely is something that, that in the books is a, is a really big plot point all the way through the series. Okay. Um, so we'll see how they, they play that out. But it, I think that, that was done really well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, covers all my notes here. Yeah. I guess As the I said, only other thing, oh, sorry. The only other thing I have is that uh, Loyal does notice and comment on uh, Rand's vibrantly red hair. Yes. He's like, oh, you're from, uh, I forgot the name <laughs> of the place. And he's like, no, I'm not. You're not I'm from Two Rivers. Yeah. yeah. He's like, are you sure? <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's the only other note I had on this episode. All right, well, let's move on. Episode six, uh, it's called The, the Flame of Tarvalon. Uh, so this is one where everybody finally reunites. They're all, they get to the city of Tarvalon, which is where the, the White Tower is, the, the seat of the Aes Sedai. Um, and we, we start to learn more about Moraine's mission and, and how this all kind of got set into motion. Um, it starts off with, you know, we see a, a young Swan Sanche being forced to, to leave her home because she's, she can channel and she's in a, she lives in a place where they frown on that heavily <laughs> to the point of they burned down her house. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> she, she heads off with her backpack and, um, you know, eventually becomes the Amonsi, the, the ruler of the Aes Sedai, um, we see where uh, she then passes judgment on Loghain, um, and Leandrin just continues to be a total B to Moraine, and uh, to the point of throwing her completely under the bus, and and setting in motion, you know, a sequence where now Moraine's has to, is forced to be you know in trouble in the eyes of everyone else. Um, we, we get the scene where Moraine, you know finds Matt and Rand and she frees him from the corruption of the dagger, which was a, was a, the way they did it was, it was a cool scene. It, you know, it was very visual that there, there's something evil that she just rips out of him. Mm-hmm. Um, though it, you know, it does go differently in the books, but I, I didn't have a huge problem with that. Um, and so then we, you know, further on, we learned that, while Swan is pretending to be very cross with Moraine, they're actually pretty darn close. <laughs> so, um, oh, chica. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, they, Moraine and Swan are, are discussing this, this mission that they've been on together for, for 20 years um, and how they're, they alone are on this mission to, to find the dragon. They alone know that the dragon has been born and they need to find him. Um, and through this, it, so Swan kind of just gives us just kind of, I mean, not, not offhand precisely, but she's like, I'm having these dreams and, and we have to, need to go to the eye of the world. Um, which I, I feel like they just kind of like, cram that in there they're like we need a reason for them to go there let's just use this method and uh it wasn't wasn't the best way to do it but i guess it gets gets the job done um and uh so they end up needing you need to convince everyone to go to the eye of the world to 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 confront this evil and so swan rallies nine even to gwain um and rain and, and land get get everyone else to go so and they all start to enter. And in the end, Matt stays behind. He makes this decision to, for whatever reason that we never find out. Um, Matt does not go with them, whether it's because he's uh, scared or doesn't trust what's going on or what. We, we literally do not find out. But um, Matt does stays that behind in the book or it does not. That, that was oh. definitely something they wrote in for the, the show. Oh. Um, so I don't know what, where they're going with that plot. I will we'll, we'll huh. find out. Um, yeah, I, I, I hate to think that they 
put in that story because the the actor who plays Matt, unfortunately, is is already recast. Um, they like even before the first season like wrapped up, they're like, okay, we're gonna <laughs> this other guy's gonna play Matt next season. <laughs> And I, I've never heard what what the problem was. If yeah. if it was um, huh. if it was he he didn't if he had an issue or if they didn't like what was going on or what huh. what was going on. But they they recast him, and it kind of felt like at a point in the scene they're just like, well, we're gonna stop telling Matt's story. <laughs> so Kinda, we're, yeah. we're gonna cut you out here, and you're not gonna be in the rest of the season because there's some sort of issue going on back here behind the scenes. It's kind of what it felt like to me, unfortunately. Yeah, I was curious where that lined up with the shooting as well, if that was known at the conclusion of the shooting of the season or if it was right around halfway through episode <laughs> six. They yeah. were like, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so that, that's kind of unfortunate. Because I actually, I like the, the the actor who was playing Matt. I think he did a pretty, pretty good job. But yeah, um, yeah anyway, so that... Um, that's my summary of episode six. Okay. Um, well, my, on my end of things, my main, uh, the theme of my note seems to be, I find the the politics going on in the, uh, the White Tower to be interesting, but I know there's no way in hell we're going to have a chance to fully explore all the, the various power struggles and divisions of uh of the Aes Sedai uh that are at play here um which is a shame because it does seem like there's a lot of story there that we're going to be missing out on but um it's, it is it was at least interesting seeing that they weren't all on the same page and that they aren't all on the same page and various um divisions of them have different things they want to try and do if they ever find the dragon reborn um whereas leading up to this I maybe I, I wasn't paying enough attention. I, I thought they were more or less all on the same page. Unified. Right? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, okay, uh, Moraine has been sent out to, you know, to finally bring in the, you know, the reincarnation of the dragon so that the tower as a whole can decide what to do with them. And then to find out that, oh, okay, there's no consensus whatsoever. That is really, really interesting to me. And I we don't quite know how that's going to play out in season two uh, because th that's a whole other um, kettle of fish pretty much where um, we've already got so much going on, throwing that in there and, and exploring it fully seems like kind of a tall order for what the show can <laughs> right. do. Right. Yeah. yeah. If, if, they, if they stuff that in, then they're going to have to leave something else out. And, mm -hmm. and to be honest, while it's interesting, it is not, where the focus should be so yeah fair fair yeah i have, I have a feeling in the show anything that's not you know based on the central five six seven characters is gonna have to be reduced considerably to a mm -hmm. supporting supporting shot um yep gotcha but i mean who knows i mean i'm assuming the other seasons will have similar episode counts but who knows i guess also yeah um, I, yeah, I would help. really hope that they would increase the episodes in the season, but I, <laughs> eight, eight seems to be the magic number with all these shows. So yeah. um, it, for whatever reason, that just seems to be the, the format that they want to go with. And that's probably what we're going to get again. I mean, and who, you know, this, we can talk about reviews at the end, but who knows how many seasons this runs for as far as this goes into the show. But I mean, the first book's like, 550 pages and you got some of the ones that are later that are like pushing 800 so mm. how are you going to shove 800 worth of material in eight episodes as well or maybe by that point they've cut a few plot points so a lot of those 800 pages are gone i don't know it'll be interesting to see how that goes yeah i it, well since we we talked about the forsaken earlier i what i fear is that they're going to just cut out several of the forsaken and in doing so, you literally could just chop out large sections of the book. That's because, true. Because the our heroes aren't dealing with those characters. You know, if you just chop them out, <laughs> then you know they can go do other things. Yeah, that's which, very true. Which would be unfortunate because a lot of those are really, really cool, you know, bits of the story. But um, 
something's got to get cut out to make this all fit. <laughs> right. Yeah. I guess yeah. that would be a logical way they could take a chunk out at a time, which, you know, like you said, would kind of be a shame because once we meet those characters later on, like that's, they're as nuanced as the characters that we're following in some ways. So it's like, mm. you would lose things here or there, but. Mm. Gotcha. Um, no, this episode does a nice job of like uh, Justin kind of already said here, like, so we kind of met the white cloaks and saw a little bit about their thing. We saw the tinkers. Now we're in the white tower and we kind of see the political setup here for the Aes Sedai and the terminology here. So we have the Amarillin seat, um, all the flame of Tarvalon, and they have this like, I think there might even be more to the title in the book. Like it's <laughs> the watcher of the seals. Watcher the, yeah, it just goes on forever. <laughs> um that's how the that's one million of the word count actually is just them trying to <laughs> repeatedly say the <laughs> title so but they get to, yeah you get to see and then there's the the sitter position which are like the three representatives i guess of each of the seven colors who make up the, like the advisory council more or less for the uh armament seat and then there's the regular i said i guess below that um and I think, do we meet, uh, I don't see her in my notes here, but is, uh, what's her name, Leanne? Is she in here too? Uh, She's there, but we don't really get to know anything about her. We don't see anything about her yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the Keeper, Keeper of the Chronicles is like the right hand of the Amarlin. She's the one in the in the shot where she's got the staff and she like the, clangs oh, it on the ground. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. This is, this is the staff, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listeners you don't need to see that shot we'll just move on <laughs> if you did see it we'd have to put a box or something over that probably <laughs> yeah so. oh, we put um, a box by it all right <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah leanne is um i i assume this will be a bigger part of the show later but yeah we don't really see anything about her at all here uh, yeah so what is going on with the uh moraine swan sanche uh relationship here in the tv show brett tell us about that (laughs) well when a woman loves a woman (laughs) (laughs) um it's actually from so there's actually a prequel book um called new spring um it was it was written about halfway through the series um like somewhere around like book seven uh robert jordan's like hey you know this information here let's let's make a prequel book out of this <laughs> um and i haven't read that yet i, I definitely am going to get to that at some point but um uh, supposedly in in that book there are subtle hints that that they do have a relationship so this isn't just like completely oh wow okay thin air but in in the main series books um Moraine and Swan definitely do not get it on at any point. Yeah. Um, and so it was an interesting decision. Um, I, I don't know that it really added to the story for me. I don't know. Well, I'll ask. It's not, I don't know if it's spoilery or not, but to me, it kind of detracted from the story because of uh, what I had mentioned earlier with like in the book, you get a little bit of, Tension's the wrong word, but there's definitely like a different kind of relationship between Maureen and Lan, I feel like. And then when Mm -hmm. the naive thing starts to happen, then that's like not a triangle, but it adds complexity to it. True. Yeah. yeah. And so there's, yeah, the tension that we see in the, in the show is definitely in the books too, but between Maureen and naive, there's like a cat fight kind of thing going on there. Yeah. (laughs) In the books, it does kind of feel like it's a fight over Lan. Okay. Right. And so yeah. here I'm like, well, Moraine probably doesn't really care as much because right. she's, yeah, got, she's got this got other lady one. that she yeah. has a hookup with every 20 years, apparently. So <laughs> they must have a strong relationship. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, it's one of those decisions that they made to change the story that I, I question because it, I don't know, it didn't, it didn't add anything for me. It, it just kind of seemed to be a change just for the sake of a change, just for something like a little spicy huh yeah and like a female female affair too so it's like you know i, I don't know yeah it, it's well, kind of it's like a thing that adds like shock value because obviously you know through halfway through the episode you're like 
oh man, these two are at, at odds. They're like fighting over power in the tower, and it's totally not the case. In reality. <laughs> huh. Well, I know one thing for sure: we just got banned in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't oh, say the word. We're Florida. okay. We're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to our listeners in Florida. And I, I just mean in general. Sorry. <laughs> so. All right. Let's see. Um, I did have other notes on this episode. Like they, just, they, they changed the way that the, the way gate is represented, which. Oh, oh yeah. I, like I, it's another change that I was kind of like, why it didn't add it was just kind of like okay it looks cool and and the way they she opened a portal was was cool looking but Mm -hmm. um i i like the way it was represented in the books um which is like a literal door that like a stone door like a double door that opens up and then there's a portal beyond it um Mm -hmm. That Which had I, like a sweet like leaf that had to be in position, yeah, like a stone yeah. leaf that you could like take in and out of know, the actual door. The way to open the door is to like oh, move the leaf. Yeah. Huh. Which I think they, they yeah, could have was... pulled it off. They could have had the same arches, you know, the, the pillar, not and it's not an arch because it doesn't have a top, but yeah, you know, the same pillar things with a door in the middle. Why didn't yeah. you just have a door? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But, such as it is, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that is a shame because I feel like it kind of takes away from a little bit of the um, old gear legend and like puts more on like Aes Sedai again. But maybe that's part of the streamlining again. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another uh, note that I had here was so you have the scene where where Swan exiles Moraine because she's she's forced to because otherwise um, um, Mygen, the, the head of the Blue Baja, is going to command Moraine to stay in the tower, which will prevent her from doing her mission. So Swan is forced to exile her. Um, so so the, she, they go through this, this, this exilation, and she, she forces Moraine to swear an oath on the rod, which is definitely a no-no in the books. That is way off. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you do not do that. Um, uh-huh. And and then the next part where, um, you know, it, it you know, it, it's like a, um, like a very sweet emotional moment where, where Moraine is, is speaking Swan's father's words. And I'm like, why the hell is she saying that out loud? <laughs> Everyone else in this room is going to hear that and be like, what? What? what is she talking about? <laughs> it's so, so weird. Such a weird scene. Like, that fair. could not happen because that should totally play their hand. But um, yeah. anyways, just a don't I add here and um, let's see what else I have here. Um, yeah, I they, guess they do a decent they do a decent thing. job with the two girls as well here. Like Egwene is like kind of excited slash maybe a little scared to see the Emerald seat and. I need stays true to character here and it's kind of like who the hell are you you know like I don't care who you are mm, right mm-hmm. yeah so that was a nice little scene to see them interact with the top of the tower as well agreed um, yeah or more than anything I think I was just excited for the end of this episode and they were like let's go on the ways and I was like hell yes here we go <laughs> I love I love this even more than the cursed city I think so it's <laughs> pretty exciting yep yeah that's that's definitely very well done which we'll get to I suppose right now do it okay. um Episode seven, the dark along the ways, um, which is also the question, the episode where the the biggest question of the season gets answered. Um, and honestly, this for me is the is the best episode of the season. I think it was it was everything about it. I really liked, um, and a lot of a lot of really great moments in it, and um, it it really set some things up also, and. Um, I'll make a talk about later, but it, this was an episode where, so like through the season there's been like changes in the, in the plot and, you know, things they had to do. And, and I was like, man, they're, they're straying away from the story so much. And this episode, like line things back up. I was like, oh man, they're, they're, they're actually doing it. Yes. And we'll, we'll get to episode eight after that, but episode <laughs> seven um, starts out with, with, probably the coolest scene of the whole whole uh season so far where 
we get the flashback to the Aiel War, which we don't know as the Aiel War, unless you read the books. Um, the Aiel War, uh, where we get this Aiel maiden pregnant, um, fighting in the snow, and taking out five seasoned soldiers by herself. Um, and the way they shot this was just incredible. I, I loved everything about it. It was so great to watch that. Um, and then we get to see the ways, which I was also was really well done visually. I, it looked like just you know what I expected from the books. Um, and we get the scene. And so this was a note that I had on on uh, past episodes also, but um, you know in the ways we we get this mysterious whistling, and then immediately after you get a trog attack in the ways, which. <laughs> so it's only one of them, so I don't know how much of a tra- attack you're going to call that. But <laughs> um, so Trox is in the ways, and they're forced to defend themselves by channeling, and then that draws forth um, Machin Shin, the, yes. the Black Wind, which is a really, really cool thing to see, and um, you know, really just kind of creepy and, and uh, ominous um, because it. You know, it catches up to them. It's it's whispering all these dark, dark things, and it, even in the in the books, actually, it's, it's much like darker. I think because um, it's just like nonstop talk about like death and blood and killing, and um, you know, in, in the show, it's it's more like this is your dark fear, um, yeah. which which is fine. It was cool, but um, yeah, it was it was a lot darker in, in the book, but. Um, yeah really cool scene and another another scene where Nynaeve just kind of like power surges and, and holds it back um which was another you know visually powerful scene yeah. um you know we get to they, they they finally get out of the way gate everyone's cool um they they get to the city of, of Faldara and um Moraine goes to see Min which Min we should have met Way back, maybe say like episode two, chronologically, oh. we should have met men in like episode two, but we get her here. And I was really worried she was just going to be completely cut from the series. Um, but we get men. And so Maureen goes and visits her and, and she just needs to get some, some vision, some help. Tell me, you know, like what is going on here with these kids? Um, and, and, you know, men uses her, her visions to, to give us these clues about the characters um and um yeah i got some notes on this one <laughs> mm-hmm. um we get the really cool you know interaction with with lan and his his surrogate family um and then you know inviting nynaeve over for dinner um after which uh nynaeve invites herself over for a dessert and um then we get to uh uh, the flashback to uh, um, Tam's fever dreams, but you know, alluding back to when we talked about where the truck attack on the two rivers, Tam gets injured, he's poisoned. Um, you know, we finally get to see what happened when Rand was taking his father back to the village to get healed to get some help. Um, and and that allows Rand to kind of put these pieces together of what's been happening in his life. And you know, as we'll see, as we'll see, that Rand finds out that Tam is not actually his father, and that he is a a mythical soul reborn to this world uh, called the Dragon. Um, and uh, I, I made this note here too because you know, Min makes this this um, the exact quote that she sees rainbows and carnivals and three beautiful women. In Rand's future, and that was that was actually like the exact moment where I was like, oh, "Doing it, they're they're going forward with this plot line," mm-hmm. um, and um, so we'll see how well that plays out. But um, see, I thought that was just her kind of being snarky, like, "Oh, what do you see in my future? Oh, I'm just sunshine and unicorns, you know, that sort of thing." <laughs> that, that is definitely uh, the way she says it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we'll see. I it, maybe they just stuck that in there as a. I wondered. Yeah, I didn't and, know either. I wondered. Maybe they won't actually do it, but in in the moment, I was I was excited about it. Um, so 
in the end, um, Moraine finds out that that Rand is the one that she needs, and she takes him to go to the eye, leaves everyone else behind because if they go with them, chances are they're gonna they're gonna die there. Um, and uh, yeah, that is my summary. Okay. Um, since I seem to be kind of taking points after the summaries, uh, I'll, I'll do that again. Uh, so quick question, because uh, I don't quite remember. At the beginning of the episode, did it state that was like in the past? It, it, like, it was does there, like, not. I didn't yeah. think so. There's, so there's no way for a viewer who has not read the books to know that that was a flashback. Okay. I mean, I, I put it together eventually, but at first I was like, okay, last episode ended with them going through the the gate i thought this is just where they popped out on the other side and they were going to be kind of in the middle of this fight and i I see the volcano in the distance i'm like okay is the eye of the world a volcano uh and doom (laughs) yeah i kind of thought that's what they were doing in in a way and then it's like oh wait no no this is this is something else but it was jarring at first because i didn't know that this wasn't happening immediately it's like where is this when is this eventually and it just, it was, I, I very much lost my footing it, it, at the beginning. Um, yeah, it's definitely an issue because you don't know who these people are, why they're fighting. Yeah. You have no reason to assume it's not in the present. Right. Yeah. So I thought they were, I thought, um, you know, all except Matt were going to pop out and get involved in this fight and find out like who this woman is, why she's fighting. And then it kind of all eventually falls into place. But yeah, it, it, um, it was an odd start to a good episode. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question. I, I've Okay, yeah, Machin, Machin Chin is interesting it, 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 as, as a, a, an antagonistic force. I still don't know what the hell it is. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> like, a very fair point. Yeah, it, it's like, is it is it a spirit? Is it has it always been in the ways? Uh, uh, Loyal mentions that the ways used to be different. They used to be green and and growing. Uh, mm. Did Machin Shin cause that, or was it here before that? Did it show up after? Uh, like, I have no idea what Machin Shin is. Uh, right, other probably than kind of... have an immediately better answer, but from my recollection <laughs> in the story, they don't also really answer that one too much. True. That too is, soon. Uh, Okay. Yeah, okay. That's definitely um, in the books. It's it's still a mysterious thing in the books. It's, it's not much known about it other than you do not want to come into contact with it. Fair. Okay. So it, um, it, it eats your soul is okay. the way it's described in the book. Gotcha. Um, let's see. But otherwise, I liked the the aesthetics of the way. Yes. Uh, I mean, it felt like a path between. Like it, it was like stepping between the walls of reality to get you know to the other side in a way is kind of how it felt to me, uh, and that it was just a really neat place, a really neat atmosphere. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, um, did we talk about the sudden, or to me, what felt to me at least sudden reveal that uh, Perrin is in love with Egwin? We haven't talked about it yet. No, that. Okay. Uh... But that is in this episode, yeah. Uh, That's where my notes for it are, anyway. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, was I the only one who didn't pick up on the the hints of that until it was pretty much flat out revealed here? Because it did not feel like they had, or like he had those sorts of feelings towards her, especially because he was married in the first episode and. It just that felt very much out of left field and almost like they were trying to work in a love triangle just for the sake of having a love triangle mm. to me. Yeah, the, I would say that the hints are are there in the show. Okay. Um, my wife picked up on them. Okay. As I recall, um, she was like, oh, yeah, I saw that coming. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh okay. you did? Because <laughs> it, it definitely caught me off guard because that's it's not a thing in the books. Oh, yes. Oh. There's, oh, okay. there's a few scenes in the TV show where it's very, I know, every episode seems to have some uh, situation with the two of them where the weather is cold and Perrin has some some sort of comforting for her. Uh. Lean closer to me by the fire. <laughs> Let me give you my jacket. Here, my beard hair is scratchy. <laughs> Fair. Um, oh, also, was this the episode where uh, the merchant, uh, Padden Fane from the first episode shows back up? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. we see him in Faldara. I don't think we've yeah. talked about him yet, have we? 
I don't think we did. We have not actually. Yeah. Yeah. So in the first episode, there is a merchant, like a traveling merchant that uh, Matt uh, barters uh, something to uh, for uh, a lot less than it's worth, uh, but he takes what he can get. And um, it's, he seems like he's just going to be a throwaway character. He's just there. Uh, and, uh, you know, he doesn't really show up again for a while. Uh, then I think when they're at... Um, uh, Tarvalon, I think at some point, uh, like Matt mentions, I thought I just saw uh, Pat and Fane in, in the crowd or something like that. And mm. he's like, no, it couldn't be. It's impossible. He's, he's like leagues away from here. And and there was, it was just a little brief thing. And I kind of started to wonder, is he more important than he seems? And here that kind of comes full circle where it it's revealed that yes, he has been a part of this the entire time. He's how the, the Trollocs, he's basically who led the Trollocs to, to rivers, or at least it's implied that. And yep. he's been working with the Dark One this whole time, which um, I thought was an interesting choice. I, those of for the, the other two of you who know the source material, um, is that a thing in the books or no? Yes, okay. very much so. Yeah, um, pretty much everything that happens with Fane is book accurate. Okay. Because, yeah, I thought I, I was, if it was something they added just for the show, I felt it was a pretty big leap. But if it was in the, if it was something that was drawn from the, the actual source material, I could kind of see how the, the um, elements were there, kind of, but it still seemed like a little bit of a stretch. But I presume it's a bit more developed in, in the book. Mm. Yeah, there's actually um, there's probably like three or four points in the in the show here where you um, there's a scene and there's like a mysterious whistling in the mm -hmm. background, and eventually we it you find out that every time there's whistling, Fane is there, and it, mm. Fane is the one whistling. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, so it it they they there are hints like in past episodes like he's he's been oh, there this okay. whole time, um you just don't see him there. Okay, interesting. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. I don't think either. Yeah, but yeah, okay. He's a he's a character in the novels who I don't you know, like. He, he's important, but you can't really say too much without being spoilery. I said that. Sure. Like, so yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was interesting. See, because that also kind of sets up the idea that are there any quote unquote minor characters in this. Or does everyone have a role to play? <laughs> and with the way you're laughing, I think that just answered my question. And I like stories like that, um, where you never quite know who to focus on because you never know who's going to end up being important. It makes the world feel a bit more believable because yeah. you know there everyone is living in it and everyone can theoretically play a, a part. And that is, it, it's a lot of work to try and. Uh, interweave all of that, but I respect the heck out of out of um, the end result. Yeah, it it is a crazy ensemble piece yes. where there are. I mean, you you could say, you know, Rand is the central character, mm -hmm. but I I wouldn't say there is any one single main character in the series, and there's probably like uh, maybe upwards of like eight to ten characters who are like all sharing this main role to the series wow. yeah and like you said in the last episode there's how many did you say like 140 174 points <laughs> of view and yeah in points the, of view yeah um yeah so you take you know for justin's sake and listeners sake like you take like a rand who now has been revealed as the dragon reborn but like it's not unheard of for like one of the novels to go 200 pages before you check back in with Rand again, like, because yep. there's just so many stories <laughs> that sure. they're juggling at once. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, it's a good way to put it there. I'm trying to see if I have any other notes on this one. I, I also really enjoyed just the, the visual look of the ways I was kind of worried this was going to be, it's, a, it's, you know, in the grand scheme of the thing, it's who cares what they look like, I guess, but I love them. I love the concept of them in the novels. So I was kind of uh, happy that they they looked unique. They looked like Justin said, like a genuine place that like connects two points 
between the world somehow. It's a, a it's, it's they're basically a giant secret passage from Clue. So uh, the board game. So <laughs> I, I liked how they were portrayed for sure. And then uh, I was happy, Brett. You said that Min should have been in there earlier because I did not remember where in the novel she came in. I would have guessed mm-hmm. later. So you saying it's earlier? Yeah, White Bridge. So oh, okay. That essentially, early. essentially just after they leave Two Rivers is when they would meet men in the oh. in the books. Because yeah, okay. now that you mentioned that, it does seem like her introduction is a bit abrupt. It's like all of a sudden, oh, there's this seer we have to go see uh, who we haven't mentioned until now, and. Yeah, it, it does. It did feel like oh, okay, this is where we're going now, but it also tied it ties a little bit into the criticism I had in the previous episode we did uh, on this, where it does sometimes feel like they're just trying to showcase you know individual um, uh, highlights of, of the world, uh, and the introduction of them doesn't always feel like it flows as organically as it should. Like they're just trying to get from point A to point B to show you all the cool stuff uh, that they can in the time they have. And it sometimes feels a little disjointed case in point, the fact that we hadn't heard about men until now. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a note here in this other screen I have up the recap summary says this is where Nynaeve and Lan have sex also. Uh, Indeed. Yes. Yeah. So that's another thing that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of kind of abrupt. Um, <laughs> yes. So that's the consummation of that, I guess. Oh, and then we also have the, it's the first mention, I think, of Land being the heir of the Lost Kingdom of Malkier. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which is, a, again, a little, uh, who's the guy, Aragorn from uh, Lord of the Rings? A little <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah. Again. Okay. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, I thought the the uh, the ending of this episode where we see the blight just kind of spreading across the the landscape is that was a, a really cool visual. Um, yeah, because it, it didn't feel like oh it's just like a, a swamp or anything or, or, or oh it's just a cracked you know wasteland or whatever. It's this mm-hmm. weird series of growths that kind of shields it you know anything underneath from view and it just looks diseased. Sure. Yeah, it does for sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, at the same time, hiding whatever might be lurking within, it's a really cool visual effect, I think. You definitely still could believe that Artax could drown in the swamp in that area. Just <laughs> putting out a never ending story reference there for everyone. <laughs> uh... But yeah, I, I, the Mach and Shin, I thought was well done, and the ways were well done. And, you know, it's. It's another fantasy trope, but like here's the ways that are introduced now and like in almost every fantasy story, eventually you get to the point where, or again, like a good video game, like suddenly you have fast travel and like the ways are introduced and we can get from point A to point B. Uh, Although in this story, we will say, you know, this is a very dangerous way to fast travel across the world with Machin Shin there and apparently other forces using the ways as well with the trollocs and uh dark friend as well here it says so yeah for sure all right so yeah as i said this is, this is definitely my my favorite episode of the season um there's a lot of really good things going on here that i that i enjoyed um and it, it's i felt it really set up the ending of the season really well um but then we get to episode eight, titled Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> the, "The Eye of the World," um, which is a is a cool nod because the 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 first book of the series is titled "The Eye of the World," and we the season finale here is titled "Eye of the World." Um, and the note that I made here was the episode that nearly made me quit the series. <laughs> it was that that much of a, a low blow? Um, so. We, we start off this one with seeing um, Luz Theron Telamon, who was the dragon previously, the most previous recent dragon. Um, and he's having a debate with the Amalan seat of that time. And they're discussing, should they, how are, you know, how are they going to handle this, this fight with, with Dark One? And, and he wants to, to try and cage him and, and lock him away forever. And she's like, that's too risky we can't do this you're gonna have to do that alone if you're gonna do it um 
And uh, <laughs> one little nitpicky thing that I um, that Roy was, she, she directly calls him the Dragon Reborn. And while that is technically accurate, because in this world, um, all of these souls is just a never ending. It's, it's a wheel of time. Everything just keeps coming back around. And so in theory, this, this person has, this soul has been reborn many, many, many times. And so technically he is the dragon reborn, but in, in everything that, you know, from the book, Louis Theron is just known as the dragon. He's not known as the dragon reborn. So to say that was kind of put me off a little bit, but um, that's a bit nitpicky, I suppose, on my end. Um, let see, Rand Moraner, you know, continue moving through the blight. Um, Rand has a dream again with the dark one where we actually see his, you know, his face, not, not this um, burning eyes and mouth you know kind of nightmare fuel character we actually see a, a person with a real face um and a real voice um and so then we get this this, this scene where the the trollocs this massive army of trollocs descend on on faldara seemingly out of nowhere like no one saw this coming and the, suddenly there's this <laughs> army that is as they say like five times larger than anything they've seen before just out of nowhere. Um, and uh, Lord Agamar, you know, starts his plans to, to defend the gap. Um, and let's see here. We, have, we have more with, um, with random range. They're in the blight. And, and uh, um, Rand gets kind of pulled into this uh, like alternate vision, this, this dream world that he, he later figures out is actually a dream and not reality. Um, and meanwhile, back in reality, um, you know, they're starting to fight the, 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 the fight for the, the gap fortress begins. And <laughs> another thing that, that kind of, I scoffed at was um, Lady Amelie, you know, calls to the city. She's like, we need, we need channelers to help us fight this. She gets five five people <laughs> um and two of them are not from the city <laughs> yeah and it um it's just like this minuscule little group of people and and you know, i i don't know i it, it in a way you could look at it and say well if so the people in this world if they can channel you know the women obviously because the men are are shunned and they get basically castrated um but the women, if you can channel, you go to the White Tower. So logically speaking, there aren't going to be that many women in the city who can channel who wouldn't already be like I said I. So it's but still you've got this group of like five people facing down an entire army <laughs> of Trollocs. Um and uh so <laughs> the scene where Amelie's links with with these other four women. Um and it's, it's kind of crazy, like, so the, she has all this power, like, coursing through her now because she's, she's sa- sa- sharing the power from these other women. And she, like, starts, like, like just violently shaking, like she can't handle the power. It, it, for me, it's just a, it's a really terrible precedent to set because later on in the series, you're going to have, in theory, if they stick, you know, to the source material a, a, a bit, um, you're going to have people like in, in circles of like 10 to 20 people joining power to, to create a circle to fight. And if five people cause this person to like barely, you know, basically have like a, a seizure, <laughs> like how is that going to work later? Um, uh-huh. But uh, anyways, this, this, this group of five basically untrained women um, the, the central figure being a cast out from the tower destroys the entire army of Trollocs by themselves. <laughs> and um, okay, well, we'll go, just go with that, I guess. Um, meanwhile, Rand is fighting the Dark One and supposedly defeats him. Though we clear, very clearly get 
a look on the face of this character, which he's not, um, he's not disappointed in the outcome that just happened. Um, you know, which obviously is, is, you know, you're setting up farther down the line. Mm -hmm. Um, meanwhile, back in the fortress, Fane and a, a few fades sneak in the castle, um, kill the soldiers, stab loyal and steal the horn of valier which is this um incredibly important artifact which they they they'll i mean they obviously will discuss what it does in the coming season so i won't go over that but it's a it's an incredibly valuable artifact um so they steal that um and basically, Fane reveals it was me all along. And uh, <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, um, so Amelie says basically like channeling all his power, kills everyone in the group more or less, except um, Nynaeve shields Egwene from this power. Basically, like takes it on herself. For all, <laughs> for all I can tell, all intents, she is dead stone cold dead didn't look good um, that's for sure yeah <laughs> um and then <laughs> and then Egwene, without any trailing or knowing how to even heal anyone raises the dead there was <laughs> tears of unfathomable sadness i mean <laughs> apparently <laughs> um that that uh, was probably that was the i i distinctly remember that moment um and just shouting out what the hell you can't do that you can't there's no raising the dead in this story in this world you cannot do that yeah i was Uh, willing during the like the the burst heal in the the, that earlier episode i'm like okay they're on the cusp of dying but you know healing we've established is the thing i was willing to write that off this right here though this even as as someone who's not familiar with the, the books this felt like bullshit yeah, I, I could not believe they did that. It was so over the top for me. Um, so just to wrap them up with my, uh, my notes that I had here. So um, Rand, you know, supposedly he believes that he's he's dealt with the Dark One. Um, he, he knows that he's going to go insane. And if he does, he's going to hurt the people around him. So he heads off on his own into the sunset. Um, Meanwhile, Lan finds Moraine and who reveals that she is now cannot access the power anymore, uh, which is a, a big change from the books. Um, does not happen at all. <laughs> um, so I, 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 well, I've read in, in this case. So um, yeah, I, I can go ahead and say this. So in the, in the books, Moraine is kind of not she's just she's doing other things in in book two we really don't see her hardly at all Mm -hmm. um so i think this is a way for her to have a storyline in season two of the show and not like have this character just gone so they're going to have have things for her to do because she now you know can't channel anymore there's there's things for her to solve there Mm -hmm. but it it was a it was another just another blow <laughs> to me and my my book fanboy, um, and uh, so the, the final note that I have here is perhaps the the most ridiculous scene I have ever <laughs> seen in in any show movie anything. Wow, the, the Sean Chan <laughs> arrive and bring all their force complete annihilation to one 10 year old girl <laughs> just completely <laughs> wipe her off the face of the map and i it was so ridiculous like what did this girl like did you even know she was there it, it, it seems so personal like so, so to elaborate on that, there's these, it, it, we, we cut to, we fade to black, we cut to a, a little text that says, the far western shore, which means, fuck all to me, uh, yeah, I don't know where this is, 
<laughs> and there's the all these ships that are that are coming, you know, it, coming in in the distance. And there's this little girl on the beach. She's just like, I, she, I think she's like playing with a doll or something like that. Yep. And these ships just ride up. And there's these, you know, uh, the, you know, on the prow of one of them, we see a couple of people, and in, including two that look like they have these golden pacifiers in their mouth. And they start doing this little <laughs> wavy dance thing. <laughs> and they conjure up a tsunami that just, you know, washes up, you know, like 30, 40 feet high and just like Brett said, obliterates this little girl who was just playing on the beach. I'm like, okay, that's the thing that happened. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> like they, they could have had a village. Like she was playing outside a village and they're like, came in and washed out the village. Fine. I am totally cool with that. It has a purpose. It's like one girl on the beach. Like where's her parents in the first place? She's all alone on a beach. Yeah. Yeah. Herself. The tide could come in. I mean, the tide did come in. Yeah, it, did, it sure did. It sure did. <laughs> oh. I just, that scene, I, I just, I laughed out loud, literally, when I saw that. You know, after everything else that had happened in this episode, to end with that, I was like, what is this show right yeah. now? This is... I, just, I just have a note that says, WTF is this, with an exclamation <laughs> point and a, a question mark on the other, on, at the end of it. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, that... I, I seriously had doubts whether I wanted to continue watching the show after this episode because there was it was so far off from the books. And and not even that, because you know, I mean, I I've I've come to accept that you know they've got to make changes to make all of this work for a show. Yep. Mm-hmm. But the changes didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And just things were not believable. And I was I could not after season or the, after episode seven. I felt it was so great. This was just such a kick in the nuts. I just could <laughs> not believe it. Hmm. Oh, and one, one thing I don't think we talked about, uh, Matt does appear again briefly. He's somehow back in uh, Tarvalon, and we, we see the White Tower in the distance, and he's well, he's got this dark cloak on. He looks like he hasn't slept in you know a week, and he's looking at it very menacingly, like they're trying to set him up to become a villain, which didn't really feel like the path his character was taking. Mm-hmm. So there's that, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He doesn't say anything. It's just like a visual of him, like the shot. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you all um, had the named problem in this episode because what I thought you were going to talk about was the opening scene where uh, Lou Theron looks out his window and sees all those UFOs flying by in the future. <laughs> because this is one that I got to rewatch most of, and I was like, "Wait, what happened in the beginning of this episode again?" And there's definitely like confusion as far as in the in the books. It's always a big thing, as like you know, this this was lost, or this idea was lost, or we don't know how this worked originally, but we have this remnant of it. So I guess it could be that, but I certainly never necessarily pictured the world looking sci-fi ish, which is what that shot out the window kind of looked like to me. Yeah. Well, we had yeah, the, that. We had the skyscraper ruins. So I, I was kind of, I had kind of, in the back of my head, prepared for something like this. I think. Well, um, and, and there are some things in the book that are definitely like this is a remnant of something that came before us that we don't really know anymore. But I don't know that I ever took it to the level that they show when he looks out the window. I, don't see, know. I assume this was just taken straight from the pages of the book. So I, I, had, I didn't know, you know, one way or another. So interesting. Yeah, they don't really go into great detail on uh, this point of history is, is known as the age of legends. So it's like this this period where um, humanity is is you know, coalescing, everybody's at peace, um, mm-hmm. everybody's working to help each other, and this is great civiliza- civilization um, and just amazing things happening. Um, but they don't really describe things and, and there's a reason why they do that they don't describe it because the people who are actually in the story have lost this knowledge so oh, okay you know, to they describe it yeah. to, to describe it would be you know impossible not, yeah exactly gotcha. um so yeah all we know is that it's like a time of like great invention and um just crazy welcome things welcome to the age so. of legends all oh, welcome <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it kind of tangential to this. Um, the dark one is a lot more dapper looking than I expected once he gets a, a human face. <laughs> okay, can we talk about how I first thought he was? I, I pulled it up here. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the old president of Iran. 
That's who I thought he was at first. And then the more I thought about it, I was I'm like, no, fan. it's Serge Tankian from System of a Down. That's who it actually is. It looks exactly like him. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. But yeah, I was I was prepared for a lot of things when the dark one finally showed up. I wasn't expecting Wake up. Like a, what? Grab a big little man. All right, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting like a dude in an opera coat. Like right. he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, get pissed off if uh, you know his favorite singer isn't performing in the lead role or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that was. I had a lot of questions. Like I assume it'll be explained. I assume he's somehow a holdover from that Age of Legends. But at this yeah. point, I'm just like, eh. There, there is a good explanation for that, which. Um, I really can't explain without giving too much away. I was sure. I was going to kind of allude to questioning that as well uh, without saying it directly. So I was, sure. I was, I mean, I just didn't know if I was supposed to take what happened in this last battle as what happens in the last battle of the first book, or if this mm. is a new direction they're taking it where this is something different. I guess that's happening here. I'm, I don't, I don't so, know the answer to that. I don't know if that'll come up in like the beginning of season two or if well, that's, I, I think we should probably go into a bit of detail as to what the last battle in the, in, in this episode entails. Cause I don't think we really described that. I mean, okay. we mentioned that he was in the kind of like a dream state, but we didn't really uh, elaborate. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go over that. Okay. Um, so when Rand, you know, and, and Moraine confront the dark one, uh, he basically Rand ends up going into kind of like, he gets knocked out in this, this like trance sort of where, uh, the dark one is showing him all these visions of what could be like the life he could have. He sees, uh, Egwene with, uh, you know, in this, you know, farmhouse in the countryside, they've got a daughter, uh, everyone's happy, the sun's shining, there's flowers and, and all that. And, uh, you know, the, uh, at one point time kind of freezes and the dark one shows up. He says, this is, this is the world you could make. This is, you could have all of this if you just, you know, if you just join me kind of a, a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bring and, him to the dark side. Yeah. So that whole thing is, is what the final battle really amounts to between Rand and, and the dark one. And, uh, during it all, uh, in the real world, uh, Maureen has a knife to Rand's throat saying that if he doesn't choose the light, then I'll make the choice for him, kind of. So um, I, I kind of went into it thinking, oh, it's a foregone conclusion. He'll, he'll make the right choice and, you know, say that none of this is real and, you know, this isn't, this isn't how, this, this isn't the life I actually want. Or, uh, and that kind of happens where Rand says, this might be what I want, but it's not what she would want. And if it's not what she would want, then it's, it's, it can't be real kind of a thing. And so he does eventually reject the dark one and uh, chooses the light side of things and seemingly defeats him at least for the moment. Uh, so it wasn't your, your um, archetypal like swords clashing actual final battle battle, but right. it was more of a battle of, of wills. So yeah. I, I think that's important that's to touch on. Yeah, as we're, as we're going into this. Um, and I think the books are filled with, I would say, Justin, for your sake, a pretty wide variety of what you might consider a battle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anywhere from sword fighting to using the power to this kind of more like morality type face off. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. But yeah, and it, it's bright. It, again, coming back to the, you know, just that they have to change the plot to do different things. But um, the the way this this battle is is like massively different from from the books as well, um, which is in part we mentioned before that potentially they are just reducing the number of Forsaken to make this whole plot sizable enough to fit to fit in the you know, scope of the show. Yep. Um, in the books, we meet two of the Forsaken in this one battle. And um, they're both disposed of in various ways. Oh. Um, but, and there's also a the, the really cool the character called the uh, the Green Man, who is, is literally like like an Ent <laughs> from, huh. from Lord of the Rings. He's a, he's a talking, a sentient tree person. Huh. Um, 
And um, yeah, th there's a lot, there's a lot different in the, in the books that, um, you know, I, again, as I, this uh, basically my, my, my whole synopsis of this episode was that it's just, it's so different from what I was expecting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it does go very differently in the books. Huh. That's fair. I mean, this, this one felt a little rushed in general, even, even with the material they went with, it still felt rushed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Spe especially the like battle at Valdara. I mean, just, I was just reviewing this episode a bit before we started the podcasts and like I think that whole like massive fight which for the season one you know for most of the characters this is the big battle for season one mm -hmm. and like that whole battle is like like literally start to finish is 15 minutes like that's the big battle for season one yeah and speaking of things feeling rushed I, I didn't even mention like beef, as Moraine is taking Rand to to face off against the dark one she pulls out this little figurine uh, and says uh, oh this is uh Senna Senna Grill uh, Sa Angriol thank you uh and you know it just kind of rattles off a info dumpy explanation for this is a thing that will <laughs> right that will oh oh by the way here's this massively powerful weapon have yeah it. yeah don't drop it kind of is essentially yeah. <laughs> what it boils down to and you know when, when you know rand finally does defeat you know defeat quote unquote the dark one there's this, this explosion of power as he disappears and like the the pedestal that they're they're on like cracks and like towards the end Maureen picks up a, a chunk of the, this crystal that that you know from the crack and it's this is a I don't even remember what the hell she called it and it's Quindier. like yeah, thank you and it, it's like uh oh I uh, and uh like I think Land shows up and he says, "But well, I thought the the such and such couldn't be broken." And she says, "It, it can't." And it's like, okay, none of this has been mentioned before. I don't mm. know what, if any, significance this has, but apparently it's important. Mm. Eh? Shrug. I don't yeah. know. That's fair. It, I, I believe where they're going with that. Um. So, yeah, this isn't this isn't really spoilery. Um. When when the dark one was sealed away mm -hmm. originally, there were seals that were created to like contain him. They're like magical seals, but they're okay. physical. They're physical items. Sure. Um, and I believe that that pedestal they're on is one of the seals. Okay. So what you see at the end there is the seal is broken. Oh. Okay. So one of the things that's containing the dark one is now broken, even though it should be indestructible. Okay, gotcha. Because I swear they were using terminology that had never been mentioned before, and I just have to kind of yeah. smile, nod, and shrug, assuming. Yeah, that you as the viewer, important. I think that'd be confusing. It was. It would be pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, in the, I mean, in the book, aren't they? I mean, my impression was always they were like, like palm sized. Yeah. Very small because there's several oh, instances okay. where people are like, "Look, I have a seal. I got yeah, it at they, a parade. Someone threw it to stick me. in their pocket." Yeah. Yeah, okay. and here it's like platform you know? <laughs> exactly. no one's gonna put that in their pocket especially <laughs> tiny size loyal since loyal, but anyway yeah no i'm curious where this final battle of season one with rand uh what what this is going to play out as in season two because my quick impression is that they're changing a lot more here again but yes that yeah. maybe will be proven to be not the case but uh, it doesn't seem like it is going to be okay that so um and then uh yeah we already mentioned yeah the song real you said that justin the horn of Alir was another one that's mentioned in here as hmm. well which so that'll come back up so book two is called the great hunt great hunt yep okay. and that is referencing the horn justin yep the hunt okay. for the horn gotcha so, okay yeah, they seem to be setting up for season two to be, um, you know, a good part of, of book two. Um, one thing that I, it, it seems like what they're doing is, um, I, I guess as a, as a way to shorten the story, mm -hmm. Rand is essentially skipping book two chronologically um, because mm -hmm. he, would, he would be going on this hunt for the horn in the books, but he's going off on his own. I think what they're going to do 
is send him directly to the end of book three. Basically, Whoa. he's hmm. he's going to have travels. He's going to do things along this journey that kind of tie things together. But at the end of season two is essentially going to be the end of book three. Interesting. Um, which I, I can see how it weaves together if that's what they're doing. Okay. Um, but it is definitely a, a distinct change for the books. Gotcha. Then they're doing two books for a season, essentially. I think they're going to have to start doing that. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, they're probably not. I mean, Dream World, they're still not going to get 14 seasons out of this, probably. So they're going to have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a feeling, I you know, future seasons of these conversations would just be harder to be like, <laughs> they took this character <laughs> out, they took this plot line out. They. Yeah. But so they're taking like the, the anti Hobbit approach instead of like adapting a 200 page book into three movies. Yes. And this, and this, is, this season they had Tom <laughs> sing for 30 seconds in the, in the tavern <laughs> as opposed to the first Hobbit movie where they just sang for three hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that's the first season. Yeah. Yeah. It was a ride. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I definitely, as, you know, as a, as a big fan of the books who, who knows the material well, um, I definitely had ups and downs. Uh, you know, I, I really, it, there was a point like about halfway through the season where I just kind of, I came to terms like, I just got to accept that this is not going to be the story that I know. And I'm okay with that as long as it stays true to, you know, the, the characters t- stay true to what they should be. And that the the general story, you know, s- stays on track. I'm okay with that. And and yet, even though I was in that mindset, um, yeah, the ending of this this season really um, really cast some doubts on on their choices that they made. But um, yet, I'm I'm excited for the next season. They're um, as far as I know, they're like most of the way through filming at the moment. Yep, I think so. So, you know, with, with processing and everything, it'll probably be another like October, November release, I'm guessing. About the same time, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, I, I think overall I was overall I was I was happy to see all this on on screen. Hmm. It, you know, as I said, it, it definitely there were some moments where I, I struggled a bit with it, but um I think overall they're they're staying pretty true to to the heart of what it is um and and most importantly to me the characters feel accurate um you know other than a few of the side characters like we mentioned um like like matt's father is definitely not what i envisioned but all the main characters i feel are are really well done that was that's definitely like the biggest strength of the the series so far for me is, is the characters are are spot on in, in okay. most all cases. So we'll, we'll see what they do with the plot, but I, I think there's enough there that, you know, they, they, they've got the, the heart, the feel of the show is, is there enough to, to, to make this work for me. Okay. So yeah, are I, we doing, are we doing ratings or just impressions? I mean, we could, we could do ratings. That's fine. Yeah, I don't see why we couldn't. Sure, like maybe like a, like a why I probably would do it is like a, like how well you you feel that the show worked as a standalone show, like, um, you know, like like a, like a one to ten. Was it enjoyable? Was it was it just quality a quality show? Okay, I guess that's what I would go with on that. Yeah, so I guess I guess I can. I'll, I'll lead off. I. I, you probably you know, gather from what I would say, it it wasn't a ten for me, which is unfortunate because you know I I really want it to be incredible, um, and and just for point of reference, it is currently sitting at uh, three and a half out of five stars on uh, on Amazon Prime, um, though it has uh, like nearly twenty nine thousand votes, which is really big for if, if you look at uh, like other. <clears throat> You know other big series on Amazon. Um, a lot of them only have like ten thousand votes. 
<laughs> for shows that have been around for, for met multiple seasons already. So there, there's people, there's people watching this and they are strongly, their feelings are strong enough that they're going out and voting on this you know because you know i'll watch something i don't bother voting on it because whatever it doesn't make me you know i don't care yeah but there's enough people who are who have strong enough feelings to vote on this and <clears throat> honestly a, a lot of the if you go through and and look at the negative numbers there's a ton of people just review bombing it they're like you know this is not the book one star bam <laughs> you know that'll teach you um there is so many of those comments on there that i've seen and i i it's my impression like um like when we got done because i watched the whole thing with my wife um you know i asked her well, what are you what are your feelings as someone who is completely new to this world and and she really enjoyed it you know she certainly you know, had moments where, you know, like at the ending there, we, we both had a, a good laugh over the, the whole Sean Chan tidal wave thing. Um, but, but overall she, she enjoyed it. She, she likes the characters. She wants to know what's going to happen. You know, this is something she's excited for the future of. Um, and, and I've heard, um, you know, Rafe, the, the producer of this has, has come out and, and said that, fans of the books probably aren't going to love our show and they've accepted this. They're like, they know this is going to be the case. Yeah. Um, but they're hoping that it, it, um, it, it appeals to enough people that aren't fans that they're, you know, that they're widening their, their viewership, even if they lose the hardcore fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just for, for further frame of reference the uh the book series um is a 4.7 out of 5 Ooh. on amazon as well so um yeah the, the books are beloved this the show is is very much mixed at the moment hmm. gotcha. but for, but for me personally i i would say overall um i think there there was a lot of really good things that they did in the show but there were things that that just didn't work or that it, it wasn't cohesive enough or it was too rushed. I would probably give it a seven for this first season. Okay. I'll go next, Justin, so we can leave the uh, new, the new unfiltered eyes is the last one here. <laughs> All right. Um, the show is going to earn some points for me just because like I mentioned at the beginning of the other episode on this, it's, it's just something that I didn't think would ever see the light of day um, on a grand scale like this. And I know I, I forget which of the actor actresses had said it, but I know I had read when they were making the first season and they were like talking about the budgets and stuff for the show that they had made a comment that they literally spent a um, million dollars to build the two rivers village for the premiere episode and then promptly burned it down at the end of that same episode. (laughs) Um, And it was like in the context of like how crazy TV episode budgets have gotten in the last, you know, 10, whatever years. But the fact that Amazon is putting all this money into this is really exciting. Um, It's uneven at times. Sure. Another thing, you know, which is not the same topic, but I think we'll, factor into how this does long term is amazon also has the rights to the new lord of the Rings series which comes out very soon and is that going to be too much high fantasy drama for one streaming platform to have and much less i mean in general and if that's the case you know i would think lord of the rings still probably has more name value than the wheel of time is that going to hurt this series just by the virtue of that series being there i don't know it might or maybe this just kicks off like you know how many comic book movies are made every year like 12 that come out to movie theaters and people are not sick of them yet so (laughs) i maybe maybe does the opposite maybe it comes out and draws up more interest in this show and people go out and watch the show because you know pops up hey if you like this show amazon recommends you'd also like this other show that we Mm. yeah that certainly seems possible it could be i mean character wise i think you know 
Brett probably covered some of my feelings here as well. I, I do think they did a really good job casting the the primary leads, um, Perrin, Matt, Rand, Gwen, even uh, Nynaeve, especially Lan. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm a little more mixed on him, but he's just supposed to be like this stoic stone faced guy, which he's pretty low emotion in the show. Maybe he shows more emotion in the show actually than he does in the books. And yeah, Moraine, I think is fine too. Uh, one thing that we didn't touch on either, uh, and I don't know, Brett, maybe just from listening to it multiple times or maybe knowing more about it, it definitely felt like they souped up the like ethnicity and racial quantity of the primary characters. Yeah, it um, descriptions in the book are are actually for, for how many things are are very well described in the books. Um, how the characters like the ethnicity and and like skin color um actually are not talked about really thoroughly in the book so it 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 really kind of is open to what you want it to be and that this certainly was one of the things when they started you know revealing who has been cast in some of these roles there was i saw so many people like parent can't be black what are you doing (laughs) and i i don't I don't know that at any point in the book they say he's like pale skinned. So he, yeah. he very easily could be. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would agree that it, um, I think they've, they've gone out of their way to represent many nationalities of our world in this show, you know, cause you've got, um, you know, you've got Caucasians, um, You've got African Americans, you've got Asians, um, yep. you've got Logan, who is um, you know Spanish, mm-hmm. you know of some sort, um, and it, yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely intentionally diverse, where in in the books it's not actually spelled out so well. Yeah, what these people could be. I mean, it's probably a good decision. And, you know, Justin had mentioned already, like the more female centric approach. Well, that's just the series in general, I feel like, but, you know, in particular with the show, like representation, I suppose on a mainstream show of this nature, having more types of people is probably not a bad thing, especially, I mean, if you're trying to appeal to today's audiences, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it seems like you would draw more people in that could relate to somebody in the show uh, and even... Mm -hmm sexual preferences and like other things are addressed here as well which right you've got not always every time yeah you really do so i mean overall i'm gonna just kind of quick summarize this then and say i I really enjoyed a lot of the parts to this i enjoyed the characters quite a bit plot does take some paths here and there that maybe are a little shakier but um the the biggest drawback to me probably is just the, the pacing in this first season like it just does feel like there are some episodes where they really try to shove a lot of stuff in a very short period and then you know there's better well done parts that are more drawn out and let the characters breathe a little bit let the plot go a little bit more uh so i'd probably hover somewhere around maybe like a man's tough maybe like 7.5 eight ish probably 7.5 i guess tempted to go up a smidge just because of love for the books and things that but i'll I'll go 7.5 for season one okay uh so that leaves me um I will say, as a first exposure to all of this, uh, I didn't leave unhappy. Um, it's uh, it drummed up my interest. Uh, it, the show kept my interest through, throughout the whole season, even if I had some questions about what are apparently very pertinent things that happen uh, and that aren't really explained. Uh, it was it, it was a world that felt like it had life to it. And even if we don't get to fully understand all of the history and lore and uh, whatnot that's going on behind the scenes, it feels like it is there. Um, and if nothing else, the the show made me want to read the books, which uh, it, it, it can't be a bad thing because it showed that I was invested. Uh, it, it proved that there is a lot here that is enjoyable and that it's worthy of further explanation either in season two or in the source material. Um, I do feel like certain things could have been fleshed out more. I mean, I talked about the 
the one off literally one one lines devoted to like what are apparently significant parts of the lore and then never mentioned again uh i know there's the supplementary material uh in the you know on amazon prime but that's really that's not a good way to frame your story that's that's literally telling instead of showing if they had worked in like maybe one more episode to try to try and flesh out some of the the rougher parts a little more I think they, they could have done away with like all a, a lot of that supplementary stuff that they decided to, to film and include. Um, that said, strong characters, uh, a very strong story, uh, even if they made change, apparently made changes to where it came from. Uh, but not having known that, uh, I would have still had questions regardless. Uh, but I, uh, I feel that they'll do their best to try and address them in season two whether or not that will actually come to pass you know in a satisfactory manner who knows we'll have to wait and see but as a standalone introduction to the story i left happier than uh than i was disappointed so but again wasn't perfect uh and a lot of and there were things that could have been improved but i like the presentation that they they had here um, so I have to kind of fall in line with you two and give this a, a seven out of 10, uh, because it, there was room for improvement, but man, it's a solid foundation. And I, I can tell that even without all the extra, you know, hundreds of pages of, uh, of reading that you guys have done. So yeah, I, I enjoyed this. I want to see where it goes. Um, and I'll, I'll be watching season two and I'll certainly be reading the books once I, uh, finish my current read. So yeah, I enjoyed this. Well, that's excellent here. Yeah. As, as a, like I say, as, as a fan of the books, that that's certainly something that I I enjoy here is that it's bringing people, it, it's it's proving that the story is is good and and enjoyable and um, you know, it's something that people want to watch. So mm-hmm. that certainly is good to hear, despite my my misgivings <laughs> about some of it. But. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like it sounds like we just gave it a three point five out of five. We, we kind of did. <laughs> we really when I did. heard you say that was the rating, I'm like, well, that's a little awkward. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I suppose that just about covers everything. I think so. Uh, somebody has some closing thoughts or notes that they haven't uh, haven't brought up yet to this point? No, uh, I I think we were fairly exhaustive uh, on all this. <laughs> we we certainly <laughs> put enough time into it. Yeah. So Yeah. Thanks for sticking it was, with it us. It was for, enjoyable. For two had, episodes. I, I, yeah. I mean, honestly, I think we could, there, there's enough here that we could have talked for even much longer if we really, really yeah. wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, that's that's it. Uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of uh, source <laughs> material for this. So there is. I look forward to talking about season two after it drops, and who knows, maybe even that Lord of the Rings show once that uh, yeah that hits. Yeah, that'll be great to do. Okay, sounds, sounds good. Cool. All right. Well, All right. with that, I suppose it's time for us to sign off with this episode of Friends Occasionally Not Disagreeing. Yeah. Um, are we signing off in our now customary manner? Oh, I think we should. I, I, I think we have to. I'll keep it going. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to start it. All right. Uh, well, you're the host, so go ahead. <laughs> oh, balls. All right. <laughs> um, Friends, Friends Occasionally Occasionally Hi, everyone. (laughs) Have a good night, everyone.